Hello, my name is Elijah Wells, and today is my list of my favourite films of 2021. 2021, it's a year that got better, that was definitely better than 2020, which isn't exactly saying much, but it's better nevertheless. It had some brilliant moments like the vaccine, some embarrassing moments like the European Super League taking off, crashing, then burning faster than you can say. Clear, clear, clear water, clear, Credence Clearwater Revival and some controversial moments like the Tory corruption scandal that's happening right now as we speak and how the Republicans reacted to January the 6th riots. Some brilliant moments like some moments that have been in history books like Team GB's performance in the Tokyo Olympics and of course the England's performance at the Euros and some moments that are just question humanity like Prince Andrew's uh, sex, uh, sex, sexual assault scandal and Meghan Markle's allegations of racism within the royal family. But nevertheless, let's check out what my favourite films were of 2021. But for the first stop, here are some honourable mentions. Dune, Shang-Chi, Encanto, Matrix Resurrections. And now for the top 10. At number 10, it goes to Demon Slayer, The Mungan Train. Like, I had a world of time at the theatres when that came out. Of course, being a continuation of the Demon Slayer anime series, which you can now watch on on Netflix, it's basically uh, Tanjiro uh, finding that his family got slaughtered and his sister, Nezuko, turns into a demon. In this one, uh, uh, Tanjiro must fight, fight a demonically possessed train. Not something you hear every day, but it is what it is. Like, the, the animation is crisp as well. The characters are brilliant and well developed. The score work is amazing. The sound effects are br impressive. Like, I saw this in IMAX. Like, I think it was like the first time in like a couple years since I've seen it. And first time post lockdown being done IMAX cinemas. Like, it, it was very special to me. Like, and also, it was also the year when. An where anime is done, it's done to become like taken seriously since anime consumption became uh, got grew a lot bigger due to the lockdown, like My Hero Academia, and even Dragon Ball Z uh, had a float uh, during the Macy Day Parade. And of course, about Demon Slayer, the Mungan Train also became one of the biggest anime films and Japanese films of all time. And I think it was also the first foreign language film to uh, hit number one at the U.S. box office charts. Like. It shows how big deal uh, this anime is, even though it's now into its second season, which I can't wait to see when it officially comes on Netflix. Like, this was a well of time. I actually freaking enjoyed that movie a lot. Number 10 was Demon Slayer The Mungan Train. Number 9 is from one of my favourite directors working at the moment, and it's French Dispatch by Wes Anderson. Even though, again, it's not, gonna be, it is not my favourite of his films, uh, my favourite being Grand Budapest Hotel and Royal Tenenbaums, but this is a treat for the eyes. Like, I really like that movie, particularly with its mise-en-scene, its cinematography, its set decoration, which are usually these very strong points of Wes Sansa film, as well as his writing and his really unorthodox direction. It basically tells three stories, which is somewhat new to uh, his usual form formula, like it usually follows one story and some subplots here and there, but it's it, 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 it basically three films within a film. Like, I think it just, uh, Wes Anderson kind of stepped out of its comfort zone a little bit more than this, this time and was delayed again due to COVID. And I think this time it really paid off. Like, the cinematography is gorgeous, the acting from an, an ensemble cast is great, the writing is brilliant, and this music work by Alexander Disvla is gorgeous as well. Like, uh, this is, uh, we'll just say Wes Anderson uh, continuing his strong form, which he continued off the back of Grand Budapest Hotel and Isle of Dog. Like, I can't wait to see what he's doing next. Like, he's doing a film with Tom Hanks and doing a Raoul Dahl movie on Netflix with Ben Cumberbatch. Like, he has a, or, he's already coming off strong with his strongest films and he hopefully might continue it uh, more uh, with his upcoming projects. At number 8, from another author to another author, we go to Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. Like, I was skeptical when this movie got announced because it was a remake of an already critically acclaimed and successful movie. Like, it won, like, a boatload of Oscars. Like, like, does Steven Spielberg want to remake this or is he just officially ran out of ideas? But when he did release the movie, 
it made total sense why he made remade the movie. Outside of uh, making it a film more of a modern, more sleek version, despite the fact it takes place in the 50s in New York, it, the movie is a more faithful adaptation to the original musical it was based on, as well as having uh, Rita Morane uh, from the original movie uh, uh, appear in this movie as well. Uh, the acting of uh, uh, Ariane de Brose and, uh, and Rachel Ziegler is brilliant in this movie. The cinematography is gorgeous, the music is immaculate as well. Like, even the opening shot uh, uh, was pretty gorgeous and some stand sequences are, are so beautifully shot and, and brilliantly choreographed. Like, uh, this is interesting because Steven Spielberg had never directed a musical before. Like, this is his first time dipping his toes into uh, musical territory, and he undoubtedly succeeded, critically. Even though the movie just made just over half of its $100 million budget, and most likely bombed in the box office. But anyway, since I've actually seen it in cinemas, I actually had a, a pretty good time in the cinema, uh, watching this movie. Like, I feel like uh, Steven Spielberg uh, pretty much... Uh, uh, has full reign of, of what he can do now. Like he's making his, his next one being a semi-autobiography about himself. And also, if he were to dip his toes again to musical, I'm more than ready to see what he's up to. For number seven, I didn't get around to doing a review of this because this was a Netflix original, and we were, I was in the midst of a lockdown, so I n I would have done this review back then, but I. I didn't get around to doing it, but number seven is Mich Mitchell's First in the Machines. I, again, really like that movie. Uh, particularly uh, 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 having the main character, Kate, be a film student like, like me. Of course, me being a film student, and has some gorgeous animation as well, and some great music as well, and some pretty funny humour as well, and great voice cast like Olivia Colman, Danny McBride, and Mara Rudolph, uh, to name a few. And of course, ha has some uh, incredibly, it doesn't rely on mostly like uh, ridiculous quotes or uh, this and that, but it does rely on some gr uh, some great comedy, particularly with the dad who, uh, his arc was that he was a, a an enthusiast with nature to a person who will freak out over an Amazon delivery. Like, uh, we, it kind of shows uh, uh, the progress of that character, like, it's just one of the uh, most uh, hilarious arcs as well. It's also, uh, it's pretty, it, it, it does get some uh, some interesting ideas across, like, our over-reliance on technology, and particularly on social media. And also having Kate uh, 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 being uh, openly gay, without uh, explicitly saying so, just implying it. But I would just say it, it, it used it pretty much used Disney and rubbed it on uh, rubbed it on the floor uh, after Disney got criticism for treating gay characters like cameos or just glorified extras. Uh, Mitchell's Machines uh, did it in a way that is both uh, both uh, both subtle and pretty progressive. Well, so uh, cheers to Netflix and Sony because I actually really enjoyed the movie with its brilliant direction and some uh, some great great writing as well. At number six, it's Danny Craig's final outing as James Bond in No Time to Die. Uh, this one is, uh, would I say, a less action-packed of the Bond films, and more of a meditation on his entire as his entire career as James Bond. The movie has some great action, some beautiful cinematography, great mise en scène, and some great performances by Daniel Craig, and also a brilliant opening song by Billie Eilish. Like, this is like a brilliant farewell uh, to James Bond, uh, or Daniel Craig's uh, version of James Bond, as well as navigating uh, his world uh, uh, after he left after Spectre, which was a ma which uh, was a massive improvement over Spectre. Uh, particularly uh, having a female uh, James Bond, at, and of course uh, she having uh, re uh, returning uh, her title 007 to James Bond. Which is a uh, very interesting. After there was some criticism, like "Ooh, James Bond's going woke," uh, it kind of does it and doesn't uh, do it. Like I think I said in my review back then, that it, like really oversold it. I think this is um, the better way of like going woke, uh, which is like be very respectful to the like past interpretations without uh, trying to almost recon it entirely. Like. I'm kind of looking at Hero High or Daily Mail uh, at that, but really, 
Yeah, this is a, a great finale of one of the, the greatest like franchises of the 21st century. Like, I hope whoever's going to play Bond next, whether it's going to be male or female, I have, I want to uh, say good luck to them because this is a brilliant finale to easy uh, one of my pers personally one of my favorite Bond actors. So, no time to die. This will be meted with a lot of fanfare for number five. It's Spider-Man: No Way Home, uh, with Peter Parker uh, on the run after the events of Long Way Home. Uh, this time he uh, tries to team up with Doctor Strange to basically. Erased uh, everyone uh, uh, from uh, that he that he in fact uh, killed people in London, even though that's a completely false. But what actually ended up doing that he botched the spell, and everyone from the two previous universes uh, come in towards the Marvel universe or the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I, again, this is like a, a complete uh, treat for the eyes and treats for the fans, like particularly the acting, the, the visual effects, and of course. The emotional weight of the movie, like this was one of the more emotional movies out there and it feels uh, more engaging uh, than let's say Internals which tried too hard to like please more indie and more art house fans and well completely forgot how to make a make a movie compelling and uh, have them in, uh, characters out like interesting to care about. But for this one they included not just villains from the past universe but even actor Tom McGuire and Andrew Garfield, the former not being practically be seen since 2017's Boss Baby. Uh, like, th this was uh, a little bit of an emotional one as uh, both of them refer to uh, Tom Holland Spider-Man as a little brother. And, and that Marvel got out of their own way to cast both of them, again, like, almost like an apology for doing them dirty after, the, after Toby Spider-Man 3 didn't do that well with critics and Amazing Spider-Man 2. With, with Garfield, pretty much left a sour impression with a lot of people, despite some fans out there. Like, the, the acting, particularly both of them, are incredibly brilliant, inc including the chemistry, like, uh, including scenes where P. Parker gets mixed up with P. Parker, and P. Parker gets mixed up with P. Parker. Like, it gets that funny. And also, uh, that meme where, where it has three Spider-Men, uh, like, pointing at each other. Please know what meme I'm talking about. Like it, it is such a, it is a definitely a film made for fans, and it's again satisfying for the fans. Like the chemistry is brilliant, the acting is brilliant, and the action scenes are great too. Like um, even if this is the final ever like Spider-Man move, a movie we're getting, or if it's just gonna be like the Americans' answer answer to Doctor Who, where we get an actor replacing him every like five or ten years. Anyways, this is definitely a, a, a Tom Holland Spider-Man uh, ending the trilogy if there's a fourth one on a high note, depending if there's going to be a fourth one or not, but we'll see. At number four, we're, we're leaving the more fan servicey area of my top ten films and entering into more serious territory, particularly for number four is Jane Champion's The Power of the Dog. like. That, that movie just was so damn brilliant. Uh, the direction of, and screenplay of Jane Champlin, particularly this was her first film for like 12 years or something. The cinematography of New Zealand, particularly uh, being shot in New Zealand was gorgeous. The score by Johnny Greenwood is amazing. The performances of Bendit, Cumberbatch, Kirsten Stunt and, uh, and Smith McPhee are brilliant. Like The movie's on Netflix though, but, but still this is a Gorgeous a movie with some uh, with some really intense performances, particularly that of Bender Cumberbatch, who plays an uh, a dominating, bullying, and often a really creepy cowboy who stalks over uh, Kirsten Stunt's uh, character at every turn he has. Particularly with the with the banjo guitar scene, which is pretty eerie at best. Like. This movie, uh, what to say, gets really under your skin and does not go out of it at all. And also, Johnny Greenwood's score is brilliant. Like, I am going to... Uh, he does have uh, more films coming up uh, in this list, uh, but damn, 2021 was a good year to be a Radiohead fan, even though they've not released an album since 2016's A Moonshaped Pool. But not to be distracted, this is a great movie that you should check out. It's on Netflix right now, but please, 
At number three, we have P.T. Anderson's new movie, which only just came out like last week. It's Licorice Pizza. Like, this is also easy one of the more light-hearted movies he's did of the films like There'll Be Blood, Magnolia, Boogie Nights. Yeah, uh, this is again like films like Boogie Nights and Inherent Vice. Uh, this movie takes place in California in the 1970s, and again, like a lot of his films, are the movies are shot beautifully. Uh, written and directed sharply and precisely in the vision of Mr. Anderson himself and the movies are so aesthetically pleasing with, their met, with the mise-en-scene as well as cinematography. Like, I, I've, I've uh, uh, gone on in a review like how much I really like the movie and also what really sold the movie out for me is the two great debut performances of Cooper Hoffman and Annalena, ha Annalena Hamm. Uh, who are both uh, absolutely brilliant in their in the film, and uh, knowing that it, it was both their first film uh, w uh, when both of them uh, uh, acting in the movie, as and as well it has some great cast as well like Mara Rudolph and Sean Penn uh, to uh, name a few like on top of my head, and as well as Bradley Cooper who's only there for like 10, 20 minutes in the film. Okay, 10 minutes in the film, but again this movie was a a kind of a, a very quirky romance movie uh, set again in 70s California and uh, of course having some great performances, great cinematography and great writing as well. Like This is a, a crowd pleaser in the movie is, uh, Licorice Pizza, which is a, it's a feel good film of the year. And at number two it's the brilliant but super unpleasant Spencer. Uh, Kirsten Stewart plays the iconic Prince Diana herself uh, during uh, Christmas 1991 when uh, Princess Diana was going through bulimia, uh, uh, keeping a hold with her children, being Prince Harry and Prince William, and uh, trying to uh, reminisce her a life before uh, being thrusted into the royal family by marrying Prince Charles. And Prince Charles straight up bullies Diana over her eating disorder. like. The movie is brilliantly acted, brilliantly shot, and great, brilliantly directed. Like this movie is almost like a horror movie at best, like something like a David Lynch movie or Satoshi Kon's Perfect Blue. Like the movie is like super unpleasant to watch as well, particularly with the soup scene and Prince Diana throwing up in the toilet, and and, and of course her hallucinating uh, Anne Boleyn and her uh, imagining to herself committing suicide by falling off the stairs. Like this movie, it's not really for the screamish, like uh, like the scenes I just mentioned. Although the movie is a beaut, again, a, such a beautiful movie. Like it has probably one of the best mise en scenes on the movie. It's directed by Pablo Loren, who previously directed a uh, Jackie and a Chilean movie. No, uh, this movie. The movie is, uh, what would I say, it's, uh, it's uh, people said it was like scarier than a lot of horror movies that came out this year. I think Watch Mojo uh, did like top 10 things uh, 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 Spencer did right or wrong. And I think there was also a list, I can't remember on top of my head if it existed now, like, like best, um, no, 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 no. It's basically uh, top scariest or top unsettling scenes in Spencer. Like this movie can be considered like a horror movie of the royal family, even though the royal family is going through a complete shit show at the moment. Or really, uh, particularly with the Prince Andrew and his sexual assault allegations and Meghan Markle's uh, allegations of racism within the royal family. Like, this movie, we'll just say, pulled, uh, didn't pull any punches, but the only punches it did pull was towards the royal family, given how really neglectful they were towards both Diana and uh, Meghan Markle. Again, this, it's an amazing film, but not for the movie, not for anyone that that is a bit weak on the stomach. And for number one of my favourite film of 2021, it goes to David Lowry's The Green Knight. Like, I, I usually contrast films uh, from uh, directors, uh, from films I've seen, again from the directors, like, uh, the reason I chose Green Knight uh, as my favourite film of the year, not just for its acting, its cinematography, its, its mise-en-scene and its folklore appeal to me, particularly that my last year's favourite film of the year was Wolfwalkers. Uh, what really uh, 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 got me for a Green Knight, it was, it was basically a massive improvement from his 
I think 2016 or 17 movie, The, the Ghost Story, which was basically a bare bone minimal, minimalist film about a ghost in a house, which is basically it. His partnership with A24, would just say, really flex his cr creativity muscles uh, this time around. Like, the movie is, what to say, it's like a mystifying mess into one's psyche, one's soul, one's uh, humanity, one's mortality. And it's almost like a staring, uh, a, like your own, like, uh, almost masculine soul staring back at you or something like that. And also, the movie, although story-wise is simplistic about uh, 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 Dave Patel's character must return to the Green Knight uh, to, uh, uh, for the Green Knight to return his favour, which would just say, spoiler, work, spo spoiler alert, it does not end well for a uh, David Tell's character. Again, this is a uh, uh, reminiscence of, uh, what should I say, Miyazaki's um, Princess Mononoke, which is, uh, again, a lot of folklore, a lot of great atmosphere, and some beautiful music, and some gorgeous landscapes as well. Now, in some great performances, again, by Dave Patel in the, in the movie, like, this is uh, one of the most uh, cinematic movies you can see out there. It's on Amazon Prime right now, and my number one film of the year, Green Knight. And that's my list. What are your favourite films of 2021? Comment below in the comment section down below, subscribe, like this video, and also follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and this is Elijah Wells, and bye.